All right, so this is gonna be fun because I'm presenting with the PDF that's back there and the whole video that I had to show you all isn't gonna work and we're kind of starting late on time, so but yeah, we'll figure it out. Which is funny because the first thing I was gonna say is I've got my lucky keynote boots on and I've got my lucky jacket and they're just not serving us today. I also wanna say thank you for the organizers for doing the code of conduct as someone who has presented at a conference where they didn't have one and had to call actual authorities to come in and help me leave the venue because I didn't feel safe. It would have been amazing to have them actually work with the person that was stalking and harassing me. So thank you for that. Okay, so I'm imagining that when you see the title of a talk that says celebrating diversity, you're expecting me to come up here and say, diversity is awesome and it brings different, you know, uh, different methods of thought and different you know, ways that we approach things. And here are some statistics that prove where we were and some statistics that prove where we are. And there are some great talks on YouTube that you can go watch that proves all that. But the fact is that talk's already been done. And I like going and pushing the limits. So today's talk is not gonna be about making you so excited and fortunately probably put a twist on how you're gonna start uh, your conference. My goal here today is to make you think, to have you actually leave this talk going, oh, I don't agree with that, like I wanna talk to you. Or looking at somebody, ah, do you really think that that was true? I wanna start conversations because I think that's what's missing in every part of tech. So. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, oh, duh, I'm not controlling the slides. So uh, my name is Elle, as you all know. I am a researcher and trainer at a company called Nuvic. What I do is they hand me topics, I go research it, I do a lot of researching by talking with the community. Right now I am doing OPSEC training. So I go and talk to people and say, hey, what do you actually put online? Uh, do 10 minute investigations on them and prove down to a person where I was actually able to find where they live. That is the way that I approach this talk. I spoke to so many people on this topic and asked what their experience on diversity had been. And you know what ended up happening? I ended up pretty pissed at the situation. And when I heard these stories of people and why they left tech because of the way that we are involved, man, I became passionate and I started telling people about what I wanted to talk about. And you know what I got? Eh, you know what you're talking about makes me uncomfortable. Ew, you sound aggressive, you sound antagonistic, you, you should calm the language down, that way everybody feels like they're on the same page as you. And I really thought about it, I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and what I came up with, if I was a man, would they say that I was passionate about it? Maybe, maybe not, but the fact is that I think there are people's truths that are unwilling to get up here that need to be told, so if you feel that I am being antagonistic or you feel uncomfortable, I'd say I'm sorry, but I'm not. It just means that this is something that you may want to talk about. Okay, with that said, my company asked me to put this up there. Uh, and also my views do not reflect the conference. They refuse that of my own and the hundreds of people that I spoke to to get this information up there. Most important slide that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is that I am a member of Operation Safe Escape. We help victims, and I say survivors, of domestic violence in the next step when they're able to escape their abusers. Most of us focus on they were able to get out, that's awesome. That's actually when the threat to their life and most problems actually start. Why am I telling you this? Well, if you know someone in your life that is being targeted, that's great. Yeah, no, people are like, if they got out, that's great. Please understand that this is what they need you the most. And what I'd like to ask is for those of you that have any bandwidth, that come and help you, uh, then come and help us because we need help developing secure applications which they can communicate with, uh, with us and going things like into their home and helping scan their home and find devices that the attacker has actually put in it to continue to uh, harass them. So I know I spent a lot of time on that, but that's seriously, I think the most important thing I think that I have to say. Now, this was the first slide that I developed when I was writing this talk. And I was gonna come up here and say, and I'm trying to kind of condense everything so we can uh, save some time. But I was gonna say, hey, diversity is more than just a buzzword. It's a fundamental aspect to progress. Sounds great, right? And companies realize that a uh, secure workforce 
brings a unique perspective and experience and talents to the table. It enriches the workplace and it brings in creativity and problems and capabilities. Um, it helps foster diversity and inclusion because this is a moral aspect that we have, not just a moral aspect that we have to make everyone feel included. And then I started looking at that slide and going, eh, that sounds kind of cringy. Like, I know that that's what's on paper, but that's not what I'm living. So I started calling people and saying, why doesn't this feel comfortable for me? Like, what is it that says to me, even though this is what I keep being told, that says that this isn't what's happening? And what I found is that people really had an issue with things like moral obligation. Even though when I spoke to people on my team, they said, it is, it's not about diversity of thought. It's not about what people from different, you know, uh, from different areas of life can bring to us. It's because it's our duty. Yeah, I don't wanna be anyone's moral obligation. I don't think anyone really does. Um, one of the things that uh, I've learned through presenting at conferences is I'd look out at the audience and go, oh, there's only, what, three women here? Four? <laughs> That's not a lot of diversity. Yeah, I'm wrong, because I don't know anyone's social economic status here. I don't know anyone if anyone has neurodiversity and they don't owe telling me. I don't know anyone's background with their family. So there could be an obscene amount of diversity out there. But all we're looking at is gender and race. With that being said, you know what I'm going to cover in my talk? A lot of gender and race, because that's what has affected me the most. Um, if anyone wants to have a talk personally on LGBTQ issues um, that I have faced, please go up to me. But my family has asked me not to speak on that publicly because of the dangers and things that can affect their life by me telling that story. Okay, so I'm going to tell my story. Now, I was born to migrant parents. We went back and forth from Texas in the US, and they worked the fields. And one of my happiest memories is going back uh, to Mexico and sleeping at my aunt's house. And I got to sleep outside under this big tree and on the stars with all of my cousins. And it wasn't until I was older that I realized that the reason we slept outside is we didn't have a place to sleep that was actually gonna offer us protection from the elements. I didn't have the guarantee that I was gonna have water or electricity. I helped my parents work. I wasn't in preschool learning how to read and write and all of this stuff. And when I tell people this story, they go, oh, El, that is so amazing that you were able to come from this disadvantaged background, that you had this life where you didn't have the privileges and you were able to get here. You know, I absolutely hate, and I'm using the word hate and passion here, being told that I come from a background that was disadvantaged, being told that I had these privileges because with the people that I've talked to, you know what that makes us feel? like you're telling us that we are less than you. The verbiage that we use is extremely important because you know, I grew up in a family and I had over 100 cousins and I'm not exaggerating there. And I had about 28 aunts and uncles before you start worrying about my grandma. Um, this was because my grandma had a big heart and she always believed that God would provide. So in the village that we came from, there are times that women found themselves pregnant and knew that they couldn't care for their child. My grandma would take them. People who put out their children at the ages of nine and 10, my grandmother would take them. So to this day, I do not know which of my relatives or which of my aunts and uncles are actually biologically related to me. What I do know is that each one of them dedicated their lives to making their children's life better. My dad left school in the third grade to go out and work the fields. My mom was lucky, she had a sixth grade education. You know what that says to me? Is that we need to change what we're looking at. Because that was the slide that was supposed to be, I'm stuck over here. The fact that my family was struggling doesn't mean that we're underprivileged. When we go into communities and say, we are gonna serve those that are underprivileged, we're gonna serve communities in poverty, that doesn't mean that they're underprivileged. And whether you mean it or not, what it says is, I am better than them, therefore I am going to go help them. And you think, that's not what I'm thinking. But you have to think about the way that the message is actually being received. Because I had a lot of privilege. 
Can you imagine coming from a family of 100 cousins where I got to run and play? I got to go play in the fields. I didn't see it as working because I was having a great time with them. And you know, how many people, when they were growing up, wanted a pony? That's all that they could dream of. Well, guess what? I had a pony. So maybe I had some privileges that you all didn't have. And by the way, that's an AI-generated image because we didn't have a camera. So I imagine that's what it looked like. My horse was that color. Okay. What I found interesting is I talk to people in tech, regardless of where they came from, <laughs> is that a lot of them talk about their goal is to get to a place where they can go buy a farm and have horses and work from there. And that's my goal. I want to get back to my roots. I want to have a house with a dozen foster kids, and I don't want a horse. I want a pack as this time, so I can share the privileges that I had with them. So this is a statement of a company that is actually out there trying to give back to the community. We're looking to empower the forgotten to work with those that are underprivileged in refugee populations. And it goes on to say that they're helping them realize their, own poten their full potential. When I first started showing this to people, it was really interesting. And look, there was a lot of cisgender men that I've had the pleasure of working with, and all of them are very great. But they were like, what's that an issue with? I don't understand. They're saying that they're going to help you. Yeah, you know what? I don't want to be helped. I want to be empowered so that I can help myself. And this is what a lot of people in the community want, because if you're the one helping me get there, what happens when you leave? If I'm the one doing the work, then I can continue to progress. So language really does matter. And when people are starting you know, diversity initiatives, one of the things that they want is you need funding, right? You need funding and you need volunteers. So let's get that out there. Make people feel that they want to give, right? They want to help others. We want the emotion that we want them to feel the best about themselves. And this works great for getting funding. I mean, this, this group is extremely well-funded. But if your goal is to help people, think about what you're doing to, with this. All right, so this one I absolutely love. And I actually gave them credit, code to code of 240. We want to dismantle the structural barriers that prevent the full participation and leaders of Black and Latinx people in the innovation economy. This doesn't sound like you would normally speak, but that's because in our community, we have learned to speak in the way that leads us to say we want to help those that have less than us. So when you're using first-person language, or for, uh, forget the term for it, we'll get to that in a minute, Language that uplifts a person and makes them, uh, makes them part of what they're doing or what we're doing, it has to sound a little bit different because it's what we are trying to change, right? It's, anyways, I'll get to that. I'm all over trying to shorten this talk so that we can get going. But I'm going to break this down. What are you actually helping? You're not helping the person. You are attacking and helping dismantle that structural barrier. You are actually helping the people. This doesn't say the community. This isn't a big group where I'm like, yeah, they're gonna help some people. This is telling me, and I showed this to a lot of people, and I said, how does this make you feel? They said, it feels like they're asking me to go fight by their side. It's like they're asking me to partner with them. And it's not my fault. It is the fault of the barriers that have been built around us and we're not tackling helping me to get an education. They're not helping me you know, get into coding. They're helping me keep up the way that economy is going. We wonder why people in the tech industry have imposter syndrome. And we tell people, oh, it's OK. Everybody has it. Even people who have achieved you know, their, their CEOs, they're up there, people you should achieve to be, they suffer from imposter syndrome. Could it be that we have it because from day one, we're telling people that they're not good enough. Don't worry, we'll make you good enough. But right now you're not. At what point when you're telling me, even when I get there, I'll stop suffering, those, uh, I'll stop suffering from those thoughts? At what point do I actually get there? At what point are we telling people you're good enough instead of saying, well, you're always going to feel like you're not. One of the things that people tell me, um, especially when I was looking for a new job, and they say, 
I'm sorry, I'm totally picking on you, um, is that you should go into an interview with the persona of a 30-year-old white man. Because when you do, you know, they just, if they fit two of the criteria, then they're gonna apply. So if you fit two of them, go and go in there and go strong. That is great advice for that 30-year-old white man, but that doesn't fit who I am. That doesn't help that I'm going into that interview feeling like I don't know these things. And guess what? Sometimes I don't know those things. And so I was really pressured when I was looking for a job to go and get this job here because I was good enough. Y'all, I wasn't. If I went to that job, I would have been set up to fail. And I talked to people who listened to that. And one girl told me every day I would go to the bathroom and cry because every day I knew I wasn't going to be able to do it. And in this startup, everything was going so fast that they didn't have the time to teach me. So when you have people come to you and say, I, I don't know if I'm ready, instead of just giving them the whole imposter syndrome pitch, how about you sit down with them and go over these things and start going, you know what, you're not quite there yet on this, but these are the things that you can study to get there. We will get you there because you, I know you and I know that you're gonna work for it, but here's the list of what you need to learn. There's nothing wrong with that. That means that you are seeing the person, you are seeing where they are, and you're being able to help them grow on their own. So this is what I was talking about. We need to think about the person. We need to think about people first language. And what this is, it prioritizes the individual before we add a label to them. So before we see them as a woman, before they see, you know, uh, we see them as a non-binary person, before we see their social economic level, we just see them and who they are. Because just because I'm a Hispanic woman doesn't mean another Hispanic woman has lived the exact same life that I have. So one thing, um, and this is where I might start making people uncomfortable, is when I grew up to Mexico, um, I think here they're called reservations. There we just refer, uh, refer to them as nations, kind of nations. And it's a group of people that came from, and what I am now told, I should say, is indigenous backgrounds so they can live together. Because Native American is wrong. And when I asked why, they said, well, indigenous is more inclusive. I don't get it, why? Well, it gets a broader piece of people and you should just do it. And no one could explain to me why we were actually doing this. So I went back home and I talked to my friends because these are people I felt comfortable talking with. I would run around and sell chicles, which are these little bitty gums that come like six in a pack with them. And in Mexico, if you are ind indigenous, I'm going here, you had a little card that lets you uh, panhandle and ride the bus for free. And I said, why do you think that we need to use in, you know, indigenous? And they looked at me and they're like, uh, we don't ever think that way. We don't talk about that. So of course they invited me to dinner and I'm talking to all of them. And this is kind of uh, a breakdown of what they said and also on the research that I did. Indigenous is an inclusive term because people need to understand that there are different indigenous people, different people around the world. Now, the reason that they had an issue with it is not all indigenous people faced the same issues. And when we say Native American, they felt that we were acknowledging what they had to suffer through. They were acknowledging the, tale, the trail of tears. We weren't seeing them as this broad group that were all the same. We were bringing it down to their struggles. And they said, if you really want to work with us, how about you say the Mayans? Because the Mayans are actually reflecting who we were. Or even better, the Yucatan Mayas. Well, how am I going to know where they're from? Oh, well, you talk to them as an individual. And one of the guys that I'd played with for a while, he goes, you could always call me Miguelito. That's who I am. They just wanted to be seen as a person. Now, am I telling you that this is what you should use? No, but if I'm telling you that you should talk to the people, if you want to serve this community, go and talk to their community leaders. Talk to the people that are involved and go with what they want you to do. I am doing great on slides, y'all. <laughs> okay, so how do we solve this issue? This is where the call to action comes because I believe that mentorship is the answer. And before you go, oh, I'm part of a mentorship program, I'm doing great, I am involved. Yeah, you're doing it wrong. So the biggest part of my research here was my 
two of my sons are now involved with computer science programs. And I went and sat down with them and say, How, how's mentorship going for you? And like, do you feel empowered? And at that point, I stepped back and it turned into a therapy session. Because what they said is we're invited to conferences and places where we have a person that's made it in their career. And they sit in front of us and they tell us how amazing they are and then you have, do you have any questions? They didn't know what to ask. They don't know enough to know what they need to know to know what they need to ask you. And so you put them on the spot. This is making people, once again, feel like, I don't know enough, I just know that you're amazing and I don't want to bother you. And then we give them all our email addresses and we say, contact us with any questions that you have, even though we just told them how busy we are and all the things that we're doing. And so I asked them, how many of you actually went out and contacted them? No one out of the 50, 50-ish kids that I was talking to and their young adults actually contacted them. So what I have done and what I encourage you to do is to put the emphasis of work on yourself. So when I'm invited to one of these talks or one of these uh, sit downs, I say, give me their email addresses. And sometimes organizers will say, well, we just have people show up. That's not gonna be helpful. And I push and I push and I push. And eventually they'll give me some email addresses of the people that be my table. Before I show up, and this is what you need to do, reach out to them. And I'll say something like, hey, my name is Elle. I'm gonna be at this table. I couldn't wait to talk to you. You know, I, I'm a researcher now. My goal is to do this and don't tell my company, but if I could wave a magic wand, this is what I wanna do. I'd really appreciate it if you tell me about yourself so I don't turn out to the table and I feel awkward. What did I do there? I placed all of the emphasis on what could go wrong on myself. I also let them know that I am excited for this. And then I will always have one person who writes me exactly what they need to do. The latest one was a data scientist. And use a whole bunch of terminology that I didn't know. I acknowledge that I cannot help this person. Now, this person was part of a women in tech initiative. Just because I'm a woman doesn't mean that that's what they need help with. So before I showed up, I went and found a data scientist by tweeting out, is anybody a data scientist? and getting their information saying, could you help this person? So when I showed up to the conference, we did, or the conference, oh yeah, the conference the table. Hey, I know that some of you and I had topics to discuss. Does anyone else, or has anyone else experienced this? And I just sat back and they're mentoring each other. That becomes a mentor for a reason. When you do these, have note cards. Put the note cards out there, have them give you their email address, and then you, contact them because you're the one that volunteered to be a mentor. And you're saying, I don't have time for that, right? I'm, I'm just there, I'm giving for that moment. Somebody at my company said, well, don't you wanna give back and kind of put that moral obligation on you? Take those email addresses and find people in the community that can help them. Have your mentorship actually reflect something that you're gonna do. This doesn't always go right. So I'm gonna tell you a story. And through the story, you're gonna say, oh, you're just talking about yourself, but follow me. I was recently at a conference and my passion right now, like I am obsessed with learning about advanced persistent threats. And some people will say, well, that's the groups that are out there attacking like nation states. And I am bound and just, I am gonna prove them wrong because it is the techniques. An individual can be an advanced persistent threat. So I'm talking about this and I'm introduced to somebody that's like, oh, Shh, don't tell anyone, but let me tell you a story about what happened. And I'm excited, I'm asking questions, and they said, okay, come to the conference and I'm gonna bring my slides. They weren't presenting at that conference, but I wanna teach you something. And their excitement was amazing, and they introduced me to other people. Y'all, I was pumped. This was the greatest experience I've had, and I am fangirling, all right? I was a 12-year-old at a Taylor Swift uh, concert, and I'm not exaggerating there. And somebody came up to see me and said, oh, you know what, I'm a professor at this college, and I think that my students could really benefit from talking to you. And I'm like, hell yeah, I'm gonna make every one of those my researchers too, and we're gonna go build this book together. And then he said, yeah, being a woman in tech and getting where you are, I think they would really benefit learning about your struggles. I have accomplished stuff in my career. I am somebody because I have worked to be somebody in the community that works on research. I am not just a Hispanic woman. I, fine, I am a technical member of this community. I am a technical woman. 
But all he could see in that moment was, hey, it's a girl, they can come talk to other girls. That was heartbreaking. It still is just talking about it, even having the confidence of where I am. So be careful the way you talk to people. There is no moral obligation for me to go to talk to other women because I'm a woman. I don't owe anyone anything because I've gotten to where I am. Then we go to a season, and this is where you take that step just a little further. You see the excitement that that person has. They come and ask you, hey, could you review this code for me? Instead of saying, oh, the mistake is right there, or did you Google it first? You say, oh yeah, you know what? I faced a problem just like that, and you helped them, and then you go talk to them about the code that you were working with. I asked somebody for help with a hangman script. Look, I'm brand new to programming. By the end of our interaction, I had a whole hangman script that had emojis in it. I was so proud of myself. And then they say, yeah, we should work on something else. Why don't I call you and we'll do some pair programming and I can help you. That turned into a mentorship for a season. They were there to help me start my programming career. And it didn't mean that they owed me anything else or that they were forced to do it. But what I'm seeing a lot in the way that we're bringing in initiatives is we pair people with, okay, you want to program, you know how to program and you program and we don't even speak the same language. You're talking to me about, well, this is the way that it interacts with the binaries because we brought in this library. And I'm like, I just, I just wanna bring the little emoji face in. So maybe you are not the mentor for that person. And it's okay to acknowledge that. But what you can do is go and find someone that does speak like that. Don't just say you can't, or well, why don't you Google it? You, I've explained this twice. Why are you asking a third time? And occasionally people become lifetime mentors. And I have two lifetime mentors. You see, I came up from a diversity initiative called Linux for Ladies. And we were given the opportunity to go and learn Linux. So I went from what's Linux to having an interview for a Linux system administrator at Rackspace within a six week time. And they gave us this opportunity as part of this program to go and interview. What I later found out is the people who were interviewing us, they made sure to know that you know, diversity is important. We want some of these people in our program. Wouldn't it be great if we did? And about 20 of us out of 25 got hired. You know, I was put to work on servers for militaries, hospitals, and Fortune 500 companies. Within my first week, I had taken down the entire network of ATMs for a banking company. I wasn't ready. And when I think back about it now, and I go and talk to the women that were part of this cohort, only three are actually still in the field. Think back to what I just said. I was given the opportunity to be in this program. I was given the interview. Nobody stopped to think that, you know what, in six weeks I went from what is Linux to a certified engineer, not administrator, an engineer in six weeks. I had dedicated my time Nobody cared. I was a woman, and they had created a pipeline to help women. And of course, there were news stories about this. Oh, Rackspace and, you know, uh, pushes diversity. But there was one member of my team who saw me as a person. And they would come up to me and say, oh, I see that you're working on a ticket like that. I actually had an issue on that. Come back and tell me if you found it. They didn't have an issue. They were just giving me an initiative to go and talk to them. And they would come back to me and say, oh, I'm working this ticket, let me show you this. It never made me feel like they were teaching me, it just made me feel that they were excited to, sh uh, to show me something new. Well, when I decided to transition to OpenStack, guess what? I went to them and I said, could you help me? They didn't know anything about it, but they went out and learned it so they can help me. Two weeks ago, I was butting heads with my company over at APTs. I mean, it got ugly, all right? I know I'm right, and I think they're wrong. It is what it is. <laughs> And I called him and I said, what do I do? I, this started in 2014 and he sat down and helped me. Not everyone is going to be a lifetime mentor, but if you meet somebody that you really connect with, I'd encourage you to keep going back with them. All right, here's the point where I poke the bear. We keep having these conferences and events where we train men to be our allies, to go and work with us and to help us. But one thing that I have found is when I go to these, I find a lot of women and minorities and just different people telling them, this is how you can help me. 
Well, the fact that out of the three of us, when I talked to them and they said, one of the reasons I succeeded is I found that lifetime mentor, the person who believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And I wanted to leave the tech industry recently because I was just done with all of you, I'm sorry. I was just done with the way I was being treated. Man, my mentor James, he just pushed. It didn't matter what I thought, he knew I was good enough. It is not lost on me that every single one of us had a lifetime member that, have, that identified as a cisgender man. No one had anyone that stood up for them, that worked with them, who supposedly had these connections to them. So for those of you that are neurodiverse in this group, whether it be ethnic, whether it be gender, find your community that you can help because there are people out there that feel that they can't make it because of a, a neurodiversity issue. The, one of the best hackers that I know who is amazing in the industry is a blind hacker. Despite not being able to see, he has found the software, he's an amazing programmer to be able to use technology to reach where he wanted to go. So that's my discussion topic for you is, can we as a community find a way to make everyone feel included without making them feel less than? Can we stand up and find people who need our help and just don't help them in that moment? Try to find a way that we can continue to help them. All right, that's all I've got for you. I didn't keep it as short as I thought, but thank you very much for having me. Thank you.